I'm going to make a bold, audacious statement. It is this. Most of life's limitations are self-imposed. That is not motivational psychobabble. That is ultimate reality. Most of life's limitations that you face are self-imposed. I knew a salesperson once who set an annual sales goal for himself and reached it by mid-October. For the next two and a half months, that guy couldn't sell squat. He couldn't sell antibiotics to a man dying of an infection. <laughs> the first of the year rolled around and all of a sudden he started selling again. Why? because he had lived up to the level of what he believed he was capable of doing and his psyche would permit him to go no further. It became a self-imposed glass ceiling in his head through which he could not break. Some of you have the ability to do double or triple what you're doing now, but when you look in the mirror, you see staring back at you someone who is lucky to be right where you are, barely hanging on by your fingernails and you dare not risk reaching for more because you might fall off altogether. All of us come into adulthood with a funhouse mirror installed in our heads. We might be bright, but the mirror says we're dumb. We might be gorgeous, but the mirror says we're plain. We might be fascinating, but the mirror says we're boring. Listen carefully. It is another eternal law of life that it is impossible to live for very long in a manner that surpasses the image that you see of yourself in that mirror, which is why self-esteem is destiny. In October of 1912, there was a baby born in the slums of London, England. His name was Viktor Serebriakov. His father was a Russian immigrant, his mother a British citizen. He was raised in extreme poverty, and he was an oddball. In fact, later in life, he would reminisce and say the children chased him away from school just about every day. As soon as he could, he dropped out of school. He took a job as a clerk at a sawmill and was fired. And for the next decade and a half, he wandered from odd job to odd job doing manual labor and was frequently unemployed. And then, in his early 30s, he enlisted in the British Army to help fight the Nazis in World War II and they gave him a standard British Army intelligence assessment and presented him with the results that his IQ was 161. Almost instantly, Victor's life changed. They made him a trainer. When he got out of the Army, he went back to the lumber business with a totally different attitude, an attitude of confidence in himself. He introduced the metric system to the lumber industry in all of Great Britain. He began to write books and articles on the lumber industry. He invented new machines to handle it more effectively and efficiently. Within 14 years of taking that IQ test, Viktor Serebriakov had gone from being a bottom of the totem pole loser to the international president of Mensa, the Genius Society, and the most influential president that body has ever had. Let me ask you a question. What changed from the time that he was at the bottom to the top? Just what he believed about himself. That's it. A former Baptist preacher by the name of Ben Craddock used to tell one of the most moving stories I've ever heard about a former governor of the state of Tennessee by the name of Ben Hooper. Ben Hooper was the illegitimate son of a poor country woman and grew up in an impoverished situation in East Tennessee. Being illegitimate in those days was a huge stigma and the identity of his father was the subject of widespread gossip in the community. Some said he was the son of the town drunk, others had their own ideas. Ben Hooper had no idea who his father was, but he knew who he himself was. He was poor white trash. He was a loser, a beggar, a bum, and he always would be. And I have no doubt that that handful of seeds would have been something that he would have clung to for his entire life and it would have sprouted in a life to match were it not for one event that took place in his life when he was 12 years old. He said he was in church one Sunday morning, seated on the back pew, and when the service ended he found himself at the back of the line to leave. He felt a hand on his shoulder and turned to see that it was his minister who said very loudly and very rudely I might add, Ben Hooper, whose boy are you anyway? Ben was humiliated. All of his life, the children at school had made fun of him for not having a daddy, and now here is his minister calling attention to it in church, no less. He struggled to get away, but the minister's grip tightened. He said it again, Ben Hooper, I asked you a question, boy. Who is your daddy? Whose boy are you, Ben? By now, everyone in the church had fallen silent. They turned to watch this embarrassing spectacle unfold. And when Ben thought his mortification could grow no worse, he said the hinge on which his entire life turned transpired. He said, suddenly the minister's expression changed. He began to smile. He said, I know whose boy you are. He called out to the congregation. He said, everybody gather around. Look at the kid. The family resemblance is all over the boy. There can be no mistaking it. He pointed his finger at him, looked him in the eye and said, Ben Hooper, you are a son of God. Now go claim your inheritance. Fifty years later, with tears in his eyes, Ben Hooper would look back at that Sunday morning and say, that was the day I became the governor of Tennessee. What did he mean? 
That was the day he let go of all of his self-doubts. That was the day he traded in that fun house mirror in his head for one that gives an accurate reflection. And you know what? I brought one with me. I'm going to hold it up to your face six inches from your nose and tell you what it says. It says that you are a whole, capable, competent human being of inestimable value with staggering potential to meet every challenge of this life, but it will never happen out here until it first happens in here. You've got to get your attitude straightened out.